Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India News Hour, India's Voice to the World. I'm Mark Lin. Namaskar. Coming up in the next hour. Prime Minister Modi calls India German ties a transform transformational partnership. Co chairs the seventh intergovernmental consultations with German Chancellor Scholz in New Delhi. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken meets Lebanese Prime Minister. Other Arab leaders in Britain says moment of urgency in reaching diplomatic resolution in Lebanon. Britain's King Charles addresses Commonwealth heads of government meeting in Samoa, acknowledges Commonwealth's painful slavery past. Minister Kiran Rejiju leads the Indian delegation. New Zealand bat themselves into a commanding position in the third innings of the Pune Test. They lead India by over 300 runs with five wickets in hand. India and Germany co-chaired the 7th Intergovernmental Consultations in New Delhi on Friday. Prime Minister Narendra Modi said that India-Germany ties are transformational. They are a transformational partnership of two capable and empowered democracies. He said the partnership is contributing to building a stable, secure and sustainable future for the global community and for humanity. Both countries exchanged uh, several agreements and they also had a joint declaration of intent focusing on enhanced bilateral ties. Here's the report. The seventh intergovernmental consultations in New Delhi with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi highlighted that increasing cooperation in areas including defence, technology, energy and sustainable development have become symbols of mutual trust between India and Germany. He noted that India-Germany ties are a transformational partnership of two capable and empowered democracies and is contributing to building a stable, secure and sustainable future for the global community and humanity. This is not a transactional relation. This is a transformational partnership. एक ऐसी पार्टनरशिप जो वैश्विक जगत और मानवता के स्टेबल सिक्योर और सस्टेनेबल फ्यूचर के निर्माण में योगदान दे रही है पीएम मोदी अंडरलाइन दैट द वर्ल्ड इज पासिंग थ्रू एन इरा ऑफ टेंशंस कॉन्फ्लिक्ट्स एंड अनसर्टेनिटी एंड देयर आर सीरियस कंसर्न्स रिगार्डिंग द रूल ऑफ लॉ एंड फ्रीडम ऑफ नेविगेशन इन द इंडो-पैसिफिक रीजन इन सच अ टाइम अ स्ट्रेटजिक पार्टनरशिप बिटवीन द टू नेशंस हैज इमर्ज्ड एज अ स्ट्रांग एंकर एक्सीलेंसी विश्व तनाव संघर्षों और अनिश्चितता के दौर से गुजर रहा है इंडो पैसिफिक क्षेत्र में रूल ऑफ लॉ और फ्रीडम ऑफ नेविगेशन को लेकर भी गंभीर चिंताएं हैं ऐसे समय में भारत और जर्मनी की स्ट्रेटेजिक पार्टनरशिप का मजबूत एंकर के रूप में उभरी है PM Modi said that India and Germany agree on the need for reforms in various multilateral institutions including the United Nations Security Council and both will continue to actively cooperate in this direction PM Modi added that both nations are working together to fight against terrorism India and Germany exchanged several agreements and joint declarations of intent in the presence of PM Modi and Chancellor Scholz which include the mutual legal assistance treaty in criminal matters exchange and mutual protection of classified information indo-german green hydrogen roadmap roadmap on innovation and technology mou on cooperation in the field of skill development and vocational education and training joint declaration of intent in the field of employment and labor joint declaration of intent for joint cooperation in research and development on advanced materials and joint declaration of intent on indo-german green urban mobility partnership for all Earlier, the Prime Minister welcomed Chancellor Scholz at his residence. The Prime Minister expressed his happiness over the meeting, saying that the discussions held on diverse range of issues will add momentum to India-Germany friendship. 
He also added that the two nations have a strong track record of developmental cooperation and both leaders agreed to maintain the renewed momentum in India-Germany ties. Bureau Report, DD India. Well, the, the 18th Asia-Pacific Conference of German Businesses, uh, this has officially opened in uh, New Delhi. And this high-profile event is bringing together some uh, 800 influential business leaders from across Germany and across the Asia-Pacific region as well. Prime Minister Narendra Modi and the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz inaugurated this two-day conference with messages focused on trade, technology and sustainable development. The Biendo Mondal reports. Prime Minister Modi and Chancellor Scholz took the stage, marking a significant moment in the ongoing Indo-German business relationship. This two-day summit seeks to bolster trade, investment and technological cooperation across diverse sectors from digital transformation to renewable energy. On day one, discussions focused on innovation, infrastructure and sustainability, critical areas that align with both Germany's and India's priorities. The event aims to foster long-term partnerships, create joint ventures and open new avenues for investment, making the Asia-Pacific region a growth engine for both economies. When Bharat's dynamism and Germany's precision is when Germany's engineering and Bharat's innovation is when Germany's technology and Bharat's talent is तब इंडो पैसिफिक के साथ साथ पूरी दुनिया का बेहतर भविष्य तय होता है। The Asia Pacific Conference of German Business, hosted in India, underscores Germany's commitment to deepening ties with the region. Delegates include top executives, policymakers, and entrepreneurs keen on enhancing economic and technological collaboration. Yes, we must avoid one-sided dependencies particularly in areas of strategic, important, critical raw materials and certain technologies, for instance. But for us, de-risking doesn't mean less trade or less openness. For us, de-risking means diversification. And this diversification is happening. Look at how German-Indian business relations have developed in recent years. Relations that benefit both sides. With ambitious goals set and mutual commitments reaffirmed, the 18th Asia-Pacific Conference of German Business is expected to pave the way for deeper Indo-German cooperation in a dynamic Asia-Pacific region. The conference aims to bring in more robust investment and cooperation between India and Germany in the business sector. The Biendu Mondal's report for TT India. And Ambassador Mohan Kumar, former senior diplomat, is now with us uh to throw light on uh, the India-German relationship. Uh, Ambassador uh, Mohan Kumar, thanks for being with us. Now, Prime Minister Modi called the India-German uh, strategic partnership. He said it's a strong anchor, in fact, in the current times of conflict and you know concerns regarding the rule of law and navigation, freedom of navigation and things like that. Put this into context for us. Why is it a strong anchor? Uh, thank you very much, Mark, for having me. I think um, the way you have to see this relationship now is that it always had economic trade and investment content, but the strategic content was somewhat lacking over the last 24 years that we have established a strategic partnership. I thought always that we had more strategic content, for example, with countries like France. I think what is sought to be done by the Indian delegation and the Indian Prime Minister is to impart strategic content to the relationship between Germany and India. A number of things have been done. The improvement in ties in defense, the posting of a German liaison officer in the information fusion center in Gurgaon, the possibility of the Germans building conventional submarines, the idea that uh, joint naval exercises are being held off the coast of Goa. You have two naval warships from Germany as we speak. Mm. Germany's own Indo-Pacific um, agreement or policy is taking shape. So the way I see the relationship is that there has always been economic and commercial content. I think the strategic ballast was missing and that is sought to be remedied 
in a hurry by both countries. Of course, more Indian students are going to Germany and that is fantastic. Of course, Germany is going to increase the number of visas from 20,000 to 90,000 per year right. for skilled professionals from India and that is fantastic. But to me, what caught my eye, frankly, and that is why Prime Minister Modi and Scholz are describing the German-Indian partnership as a strong anchor. I believe okay. they discussed the conflict in Gaza and the conflict in Ukraine in considerable detail, sure. according to the Foreign Secretary. I'm, and all sure. this points, all this points to strategic convergence between the two important countries. And taking that convergence forward as well, uh, Ambassador Monkumar, uh, Prime Minister highlighted how India and Germany will cooperate, you know, to actively uh, bring about change uh, or reform in multilateral institutions. Uh, how best can this uh, be done or leverage? How, how best can the relationship be leveraged for that? I think Germany is important. Germany is part of G4. Mm -hmm. The other three countries being India, Japan and Brazil. But what caught my eye also was Germany saying that they would like a free trade agreement between right. India and the European Union in a matter of months, not years. Mm -hmm. So that is also strategic. The idea that Germany wants to de-risk from China and they are looking at India as a potential destination and partner is important as well. But of course, what you say is right in global governance Germany and India can get their act together. But I'll be honest, Mark, I think mm -hmm. I am somewhat less optimistic about Germany and India just swinging the UN Security Council reform because that requires the consensus of 190 odd countries. Right. You did say about the, I mean, the <laughs> Chancellor Scholz pushing, in fact, for greater cooperation uh, in an FTA. Uh, with the EU, but you know, you also talked about digitization, software, semiconductor production, innovation and technology, all these sort of things. Do you, uh, how do you assess, you know, German priorities towards India? He's looking at a lot of areas. No, it's fantastic that Germany is talking about a focus on India strategy, which was mentioned by the Prime Minister in his statement. So Germany has got a special focus on India strategy, which they want to leverage for both Indo-Pacific and other things. The kind of MOUs which have been signed, I would like to refer to three of those. One is in the area of skill partnership and vocational training. India needs this kind of vocational training and skill partnership building from a country like Germany, which has a proven track record of skill and vocational training. So that's the first. Mm -hmm. The second, I believe is in the area of critical and emerging technologies and there, there again an MOU has been done between the two countries and I think that is an area where India can benefit enormously from German technology as the Prime Minister said if German um, technology can be combined if German precision can be combined yes. with Indian technology and Indian talent I think that is fantastic news for both countries. But most importantly, I refer you to the statement of Chancellor Olaf Scholz, who calls India a pillar of stability in South Asia and Asia. And that is, I think, an important statement coming from the German Chancellor. A final question, uh, you know, the pillar of stability in South Asia. Uh, can India now, you know, uh, view EU as a composite economic whole? and uh, bring to that relationship some sort of momentum to its growth. After all, the EU as a whole, you know, uh, is uh, actually the second largest economy in the world. Truth be told, Mark, I think we are some distance uh, from considering EU as one block. If you look at the Prime Minister's trips, he has already built a relationship with France, with the French president. He undertook a uh, an important visit to Poland. He's already had good ties with Italy's Prime Minister Meloni and now Germany's Chancellor. These will be the countries which will drive EU. Germany, France, Italy, Poland. Which is why I'm particularly happy that German Chancellor and the Indian Prime Minister 
have been able to discuss all the important issues, the geopolitical issues facing the world, and there is a meeting of mind between German Chancellor and the Indian Prime Minister, not just on the conflict in Ukraine, but also on issues like Gaza, and as you said, global governance. Leave it there. Thank you very much, Ambassador Mohan Kumar. Thank you for enlightening us on India-German ties. Now, still to come here on DD India News R, an update on the ground situation in the United States in the run-up to the elections. Turkish airstrikes hit uh, PKK targets in Iraq for a second successive night. And EU pledges 20 million euros in aid for Bosnia after devastating floods. Complex issues, hidden agendas, twists and turns, strategic games. We think all dots are linked. We just need to connect them. Join me every week as I connect the dots to unravel hidden designs in statecraft, mysteries and decode issues that matter to you. Watch Connecting the Dots with me at these times on DD India. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Mark Lynn. The US Secretary of State Anthony Blinken on Friday met with the Lebanese Prime Minister uh, Najib Mikati in London for talks on the war between Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon. Blinken has vowed to work with uh, real urgency for a diplomatic resolution to end Israel's offensive in Lebanon. But he said that it was uh, first critical to reach an understanding on disarmament of Hezbollah. In fact, the U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken also held a bilateral meeting with uh, the Jordanian Foreign Minister in London. Anthony Blinken uh, said that there was a real sense of urgency to reach a diplomatic resolution in Lebanon following Israel's military operations in that country while uh, calling for the protection of civilians. The most important thing is to drive toward the diplomatic resolution to get the understandings that are necessary for the full implementation of 1701. And the sooner we're able to do that, the sooner we're able to get a resolution. Meanwhile, uh, we want to make sure, we want to see uh, civilians protected. Uh, we want to make sure that the Lebanese armed forces are not uh, caught in the, uh, in the crossfire. Uh, and uh, certainly, we want to make sure that uh, in places like Beirut, uh, there is um, a, a, a real effort to make sure that people are not harmed, that civilians are not caught up in this crossfire. The Turkish government has launched airstrikes on PKK targets in Iraq and Syria following a deadly attack on a defense firm in Ankara, which the PKK has claimed responsibility for. The Turkish President Erdogan has vowed to intensify military actions against the group, citing ongoing tensions despite the recent peace negotiations. The Turkish government responded by conducting airstrikes on Kurdish PKK targets in Iraq and Syria after a gun attack killed five people in Ankara. They have blamed PKK behind the attack on Turkish aerospace industries near Ankara. Meanwhile, Kurdish PKK militants on Friday claimed responsibility for the deadly attack on a Turkish defense firm, stating that the assault involved a shooting and suicide bombing by two militants who infiltrated from Syria. Turkish President Erdogan vowed to intensify military actions against the PKK, linking the attack to ongoing tensions amid recent efforts at peace negotiations. I would like to thank all our friends for their solidarity after expressing their condolences for their treacherous terrorist act committed yesterday in Ankara. This heinous attack has further reinforced Turkey's determination and to resolve to eliminate terrorism. The PKK has been in conflict with the Turkish state since 1984 and is labelled as a terrorist organisation by Turkey and its Western allies. In 2011, 
President Erdogan supported peace efforts to address the Kurdish issue, but a truce collapsed in 2015, leading to renewed violence. On Tuesday, MHP's leader sparked shockwaves by offering an olive branch to jailed PKK leader Abdullah Okalan, suggesting he come to parliament to renounce terror and dissolve his movement. With bureau inputs, Ravindra Chauhan's report for DD India. The Samoan way of life was gloriously on display as the opening ceremony of the 2024 Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting welcomed leaders from 56 member countries in Apia today. The biennial gathering of uh, monarchs, of heads of government, ministers, as well as senior officials, civil society and faith groups is the first to be held in the small island developing state in the Pacific. The British monarch, King Charles III, the head of the Commonwealth, stressed his unshakable faith in the value of the 56-member union and its 2.7 billion people. Britain's King Charles on Friday said the Commonwealth should acknowledge its painful history as African and Caribbean nations continue to advocate for reparations for the country's role in the transatlantic slave trade. King Charles III called for community and respect as he addressed the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Apia, the capital of Samoa. I understand from listening to people across the Commonwealth how the most painful aspects of our past continue to resonate. It is vital, therefore, that we understand our history to guide us to make the right choices in the future. Where inequalities exist, for example, in access to opportunity, to education, to skills training, uh, to employment, to health, and to a planet in whose climate our human race can both survive and thrive, we must find the right ways and the right language to address them. King Charles met with British Prime Minister Keir Starmer in Samoa. Starmer said that the transatlantic slave trade was abhorrent and that while history cannot be changed, it should be talked about. Keir Starmer also met with Guyana's President Irfan Ali on Friday. Starmer also met with Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. Australia and Britain plan to work together to ramp up the deployment of renewable energy technologies. Representatives of 56 countries, most with roots in Britain's empire, are attending the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. Commonwealth Secretary General Patricia Scotland said on Thursday that the Ocean Declaration was a groundbreaking agreement aimed to fix maritime boundaries even if small island nations eventually become unlivable. The most important thing is that the Commonwealth already has the Commonwealth Blue Charter which has really been a distillation of all our hopes of implementation of the agreements we've already made on the ocean. Earlier, King Charles III visited the Valima Botanical Gardens during his trip to Apia, the capital of Samoa. The British monarch is on a 12-day tour of Australia and Samoa, both independent Commonwealth states, the first major foreign trip since his cancer diagnosis earlier this year. Bureau report, DD India. Uh, India's Parliamentary Affairs Minister Kiran Rijuju represented India at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Apia in, Samo in Samoa. Uh, the minister, in fact, posted photos on his uh, meeting with the British Prime Minister Keir Starmer on the sidelines of the Chogam summit. Minister Rijuju also met King Charles during his official dinner that was hosted by the British monarch on this occasion. The Russian President Vladimir Putin spoke about uh, the military assistance from North Korea, saying that it will be decided by both the countries when the time comes. The Russian President also referred to the mutual defense pact signed between the two countries during his visit to Pyongyang in June and the Article 4 of the pact. It refers to a military mutual help in case of aggression towards each side. But Article 4 is indeed in place. How we apply it? It's still a question. When we have to decide something, we will undoubtedly decide. But it is our sovereign decision whether we apply something or not, where and how, whether we need it, or maybe we only conduct some kind of drills, training experience. It is our business. 
After devastating floods, the EU chief, Ursula von der Leyen, pledged 20 million euros as aid for Bosnia during a joint press conference with the Bosnian Prime Minister, Borjana Christo, in Sarajevo on Friday. Speaking at a press conference, uh, von der Leyen said that the EU is not only with its member states, but also with candidate countries during natural disasters. Earlier this month, 27 people died due to floods and landslides, which occurred in the central and southern parts of Bosnia. Mentioned the Solidarity Fund. Indeed, this is the fund for natural disasters that member states can use for reconstruction, but also candidate countries, and it is very good that you will apply for that. But we thought at the moment, right now, you need immediate help addition in addition on top, and therefore we decided to mobilize 20 million euros for the immediate help right now, and then in a second step, the Solidarity Fund will support you in reconstruction. Well, amid the U.S. presidential elections in the United States, uh, there is great interest in the Indian American community in that country. Uh, the community is contributing in diverse spheres of American society, one such as public health. And Indian doctors form the backbone, in fact, of America's health system, both in terms of their numbers and their talent. DD India correspondent Shubhendu Ghosh tells us the story of a veteran Indian health expert and community leader in New Jersey. In this election season, healthcare issues, especially those related to cost and access to care, are an important concern for many American voters. Indian American doctors are playing a key role in the public health ecosystem of the US. Traveling through New Jersey, we meet Dr. Avinash Gupta, a chief of cardiology at Monmouth Hospital and a prominent community leader. 10% of doctors are uh, Indians. They are in uh, cardiology, uh, surgery and medicine and in all fields. And uh, the we are uh, giving back to the community. Like uh, COVID time, we vaccinated uh, uh, 30, over 30,000 people in uh, New Jersey. And during night time, we did a Zoom clinic and advised patients in India. Given the election time, Dr. Gupta also reflects on the key public health challenges in the United States. The public health issues uh, are uh, drug addiction, a uh, lot of uh, fentanyl coming from southern border, uh, which needs to be tightened, and also increase in uh, mental health uh, problems. Of course, we believe in uh, preventive uh, medicine, and we want to take care of the risk factors like blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, so that we don't end up having heart attack and a stroke. Dr. Gupta has spent decades serving the people of New Jersey and fostered close bonds with his patients. He's been my doctor now for, my wife and I were talking about it, at least 20-some years. And he's by far the best doctor I have ever had. He's wonderful. He's taken care of me. He's been a, my doctor for about 25 years. He was my parents' doctor 25 years before that. We came here from Manhattan. We had, my parents had the best of cardiac care there, and they were looking for the best of cardiac care here. He's very caring, knowledgeable. He is very good to his patients. Whenever you have a problem, he's right there, and he, he comes and takes care of you right away. Dr. Avinash Gupta has been practicing in Lakewood, New Jersey since 1994. When not seeing patients, he likes to be engaged in community service in both the U.S. and India. Indian origin doctors in the United States are known for their skill, talent and compassion. While treating their patients, they've also created important goodwill that brings the peoples of the two countries, India and the U.S., closer together. With camera person Jay Shankar, Shubhendu Ghosh for DD India in New Jersey. Well, still to come here on DD India News Hour, we'll be getting expert opinion on the unrest in Bangladesh. The Taiwanese president, Lai Ching Te, says that the island will not cede an inch of its territory.
recycle, repair, renew. Are these cool trending terms or age-old traditions? We started distributing the compost. The residents were really happy. It also made them understand the need for waste management, why segregation was important because it was happening right in front of their houses. Over the past years, uh, we also expanded into the area of repair. And that obviously has an additional impact on saving uh, e-waste. And that's an additional area where we see quite some potential. The panels contain a lot of rare commodities uh, and you can save a lot of energy if you uh, use recycled materials. It's also also extremely important to keep those recycled materials here in Germany. Biotanks, the sewage water gets recycled, it can be used for different purposes or drained into the ground. You're watching DD India News, huh? I'm Mark Lin. What exactly are the latest Bangladesh protests are hoping to achieve? Uh, what can we expect uh, from the five demands made by the protesters? Is Bangladesh really a new Bangladesh in the making? This report puts uh, recent events into context. Protesters in Bangladesh are up in arms once again. They have been demanding the resignation of President Shahabuddin Chuppu. Shahbuddin had triggered the protests earlier this week when he claimed he had no documentary evidence of former Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's resignation. This time the protesters made five key demands. Abolition of the 1972 constitution. They want a new constitution in the context of 2024. They have succeeded in banning the Bangladesh Chhatra League, the students' wing of the Awami League which they had accused of perpetuating political violence and authoritarian control. They want the resignation of President Mohammad Shahbuddin, a jurist, civil servant and politician who was elected unopposed in 2023 after being nominated by the Awami League. They also want earlier elections held in 2014, 2018 and 2024 under Sheikh Hasina to be declared illegal and those who claim to hold public office under them to be disqualified. Finally, they want the proclamation of a new republic, which keeps the spirit of the August uprising that led to Sheikh Hasina's ouster. Let's go back a little in time and look at some of the reasons that led to this uprising in the first place. The unrest began in July with student protests against civil service job quotas, which were later withdrawn. The Awami League was being accused of dominating state institutions, undermining judicial independence and curtailing freedom of expression. The protesters felt there was high unemployment, soaring inflation and a lack of opportunities for the youth. The protesters had lost faith in existing political parties that they had accused of violent clashes for power. Authorities under the interim government now believe they are acting in the best interest of a new Bangladesh. Any syndicate would be broken by us. Because, uh, then uh, only analyzing the market situation we can detect them, we can locate their position, their uh, status, and we will intervene there. If necessary, we will use our legal instruments that has been given by the law. The concept of a new Bangladesh is unclear as of now. The student-led protesters hope to build a society that avoids autocratic behavior and focuses on democratic principles, equal employment opportunities and a free press and judiciary. However, since the interim government of the Nobel Peace Prize winner Mohammed Yunus took office, minorities in Bangladesh, particularly Hindus, have been targeted due to a combination of political, social and historical factors, with attacks also on Hindu properties and temples. Bureau Report, DD India. Uh, Riva Ganguly Das, a former Indian High Commissioner to Bangladesh, is joining us now with uh, more on this story. Uh, uh, Ambassador Das, uh, do you see these protests, you know, petering out, or do you think that they are going to grow uh, till these demands are met? Uh, you know, the uh, uh, some of the demands that have been made are quite unrealistic and legally untenable. Uh, for instance, to declare, uh, you know, all the previous uh, uh, governments as illegal and institutions attached to them as illegal, I think that will put uh, the entire future of Bangladesh into a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uncertainty. 
because uh, you cannot uh, this is absolutely far reaching uh, legal implications and i mm. think this is a uh, it will be uh, if if not difficult it will be impossible for any government to actually meet such a demand uh, the, the demand for a new constitution now you see who is going to write this new constitution after all constitutions of countries don't get written by um, you know appointed people you have to have some degree of voice of the people in the writing of the constitution which means um, you know constituent assembly or at least an elected parliament uh, right. which you know goes into the whole process so again the legality of such a process can be questioned and it will be very dangerous for the future of bangladesh to uh, you know embark on processes like that uh, a new republic now the demand for a new republic what exactly does that mean what are the values of such a new republic and you know uh, the, a large part of the new round of protests is about democracy but yes. what has happened since 5th august in bangladesh is exactly uh, a repetition of what the whole movement was uh, against uh, because okay. uh, you know people have been removed arbitrarily no rule of law is being followed the judiciary is not being allowed to function and a mob simply goes somewhere and uh, you know puts pressure on a person to resign or to leave office so this is really not democracy and this okay. is uh, you know um, a repeat of exactly what they are uh, they have accused awami league of doing all these uh, years uh, so ambassador yeah ambassador uh, ganguly uh, you know many of the advisors also of the interim government uh, they don't seem to be in support of the resignation of the president so do you uh, see uh, this uh, in a sense that they also want to preserve some form of institutional democracy that exists see uh, the uh, bangladesh government at present is in a sort of a uh, you know a questionable uh, legal entity mm. uh, they have taken oath of office uh, on the basis of the constitution that exists right now now a president there is uh, and and the president has uh, given That's them, them in, yes yes now they are demanding that this president should now leave now if this president should resign who will he give his resignation to because as per the constitution the resignation can be accepted only by the speaker the speaker is not there and if the president goes then as uh, you know one of the political parties has said there is a chance of uh, you know political uncertainty and political vacuum and the government that exists right now the interim government it is not it, it does not reflect the will of the people it has been put there by those who were at the forefront of the uh, protest movement and right. uh, most of the people in this uh, government are not elect uh, have no uh, political background they do not represent political parties so yes. i think bangladesh is going through a very very difficult period and there are serious legal and constitutional issues that the country has to grapple with as it moves forward so how long do you think this interim period is going to last when do you think the country can have uh, elections again uh see as i see it now initially uh, the army chief have said had said last month that you know in 18 months election will be held at that point the interim government uh, sort of made an announcement i mean uh, professor uh, yunus himself said that we will decide when the election uh, will be held and then one of the advisors said the election will be held in 2025 but i think that there is after the latest round of protests uh i think there's going to be impatience among the political parties particularly bnp uh, would not like to wait for an indefinite period and there are more and more voices coming out of bangladesh now saying that uh, you know you have to have an election as soon as possible okay. uh, so really the interim <laughs> government will have to do some introspection and come up with a timeline of exactly how they want to move forward what will come first and you know they have to prioritize basically on the various activities that they have taken upon themselves and i'm sure there's going to be a lot of pressure on okay. having elections as well a final question uh, ma'am uh, you know the awami league did uh, seem to have popular support after all it won so many elections uh, surely some support uh, still exists in pockets so what do you think i mean uh, the supporters of the awami league will be doing at this time see uh, uh, awami league has played a absolutely historical role in the birth of bangladesh you cannot deny the role that uh, sheikh mujibur rahman played and the party played 
let us go back a little in history in 75 when Sheikh Mujib was assassinated Awami League was completely decimated it was a time of great turmoil but Awami League came back it has that resilience it has the ability to come back and every election has shown that uh, you know the uh, by and large the voting percentage between Awami League and BNP is plus or minus uh, you know, 5% or something. So there is a considerable amount of more than 30% of the people in every election sort of vote for the Awami League. So to say that, you know, Awami League will be finished or will be gone forever, I don't think that is possible. Uh, you cannot, uh, you know, I mean, it, it may be, uh, you know, for the time being, uh, simply, uh, you mm. know, the kind of tactics that uh, people are using on the road, on the streets, Awami League uh, leaders are not allowed to, uh, uh, you know, they're they're on the run basically. And if somebody surfaces somewhere, he's beaten down, beaten, uh, beaten to uh, death. Yes. Uh, Awami League will take a little time to regroup itself, but it cannot just simply disappear. It's a party with a lot of grassroots support. It is a very, it is a very strong cadre-based party, and it has the ability okay. to, uh, you know, come back. And uh, so history will tell what will happen, but the kind of retributive politics that we see in Bangladesh and which is, you know, has come back in cycles every few years. Right. That they will have to deal with internally at some point of time. We'll leave it there. Thank you very much, uh, Reva Ganguly Das, uh, Ambassador Das. Thank you for being with us. Now, at least uh, 10 punk, uh, Pakistani frontier police, they were killed in a militant attack. Uh, this was on an outpost near the northwestern city of uh, Dera Ismail Khan. It happened Thursday and uh, the attack comes as Pakistan battles a resurgence of militant attacks in its uh, rugged northwest as well as a growing ethnic separatist insurgency in the south. The Interior Minister Mohsen Nakwi strongly condemned the attack. Three senior police sources have said that a large group of militants stormed the outpost killing personnel of the Frontier Constabulary Security Force Tehreek e Taliban Pakistan group has claimed responsibility for the attack. They called it a retaliation for the killing of the senior leader Ustad Qureshi. The Taiwanese President uh, Lai Ching Te has said that the island will not cede an inch of its territory as China maintains uh, military pressure on Taipei to accept its sovereignty, its claim of sovereignty as well. Now, Lai has said that uh, these remarks, uh, he made them during a visit in the Kinmen Islands of China for the 75th anniversary of the victory over communist forces in the Battle of Guningtao. It followed a fortnight of intense military activity in the Taiwan Strait, the sensitive waterway that separates China and Taiwan with troops from both sides holding drills. Today, Guningto is more than just a symbol of military victory. It also represents our determination to protect our country. We will not yield an inch of ground in Taiwan, Penghu, Kinmen and Matsu to firmly defend our homeland. The two-day DRDO Directors Conclave 2024 commenced in Pune on October 25. Now this year's theme of the conclave is transforming DRDO or redefined defense R&D. Now, the aim of the conclave is to inform the participants about the series of DRDA reforms that have been implemented towards making DRDA a more efficient organization. The annual conclave marks a significant gathering to reform and transform India's defense research and development organization. The Department of Biotechnology and the Indian Space Research Organization have signed a memorandum of understanding on Friday to cooperate and collaborate on space biotechnology research. The partnership will focus on areas such as microgravity research, space biomanufacturing, bioastronauts, and also space biology. The MOU was signed by the ISRO chairman, Dr. Somnath, and the secretary of the Department of Science and Technology, Rajesh Gokhale. Uh, let's take a look now at uh, other stories making news around the world. Dinosaur fossils have been discovered from, the, uh, from Hong Kong. This is the first time there. In fact, experts identify these fossils as belonging to a large-aged dinosaur from the Cretaceous period, 
which is around 145 million or six, uh, about 60, but that's the range, 145 million to 66 million years ago. The fossils were put on public display on Friday. Six people stand trial in Vietnam over a huge fire that broke in a karaoke bar two years ago, killing 32 people. The blaze broke out in a province close to Ho Chi Minh City. The fire accident led to the closure of thousands of karaoke bars nationwide for failing to meet fire regulations. Indonesia's new president, Prabhovo Subianto, hosted his cabinet at an army academy to train them. Cabinet ministers were dressed in camouflage fatigues. They stayed in tents and they, you know, were ordered to march. SpaceX's Crew-8 astronauts returned to Earth on the Dragon spacecraft from the International Space Station on Friday. The astronauts conducted uh, new scientific research to advance human exploration beyond low Earth orbit. Still to come here on DD India News are the Russian Central Bank has hiked benchmark uh, interest rates to 21 percent. That's the highest since 2003. The Indian Grandmaster Arjun Erigaisi becomes the second Indian to cross the 2800 ELO rating. In fact, he's now the third in the world, very close to being the second world number two. He's just a few points away. Who will be the next president of United States of America? Will Donald Trump make a dramatic comeback or will Kamala Harris become America's first woman president? It's a tight race to the White House. The knives are out and the battle lines sharply drawn. He's becoming increasingly unstable and unhinged. She's a threat to democracy because she shouldn't even be the candidate. I'm Amrit Pal Singh. I'm Shubhain Dukhosh. We travel across the United States to decode the issues at the heart of this polarized election. Watch this space only on DD India. Complex issues, hidden agendas, twists and turns, strategic games. We think all dots are linked. We just need to connect them. Join me every week as I connect the dots to unravel hidden designs and statecraft, mysteries and decode issues that matter to you. Watch Connecting the Dots with me at these times on DD India. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Mark Lynn. The Indian Finance Minister, who is visiting the United States for the annual meetings of the IMF and the World Bank, has stressed that uh, job creation is the most critical issue worldwide, particularly given the persistent economic challenges. While speaking on the topic of how should the World Bank shape its future strategic direction and help clients create more jobs to keep pace with evolving uh, mega trends, Nirmala Sitaraman emphasized that jobs are the most pressing global issue given the continued economic headwinds and rapid technological change that are redefining the skills required for youth to enter the job market. In addition to the traditional manufacturing-led uh, development pathway, Sitaraman highlighted the need to explore alternative growth strategies and uh, the types of jobs also that they will generate. Still with business-related news, uh, Russia's central bank has hiked its key interest rate by 200 basis points on Friday, and it's now 21%, and this is the highest level ever, in fact, highest level since the early years of President Vladimir Putin's rule in 2003, when Russia was recovering from the chaos that followed the collapse of the Soviet Union. The central bank said that the hike was necessary to fight inflation, which is currently at 8.4%, fueled by massive budget spending. Today, we have made the decision to raise the key rate to 21% per annum. 
Price growth has accelerated since September. Inflation expectations have risen as well. Lending has continued to grow rapidly due to limited labor resources and high capacity utilization rates. Enterprises have been increasingly experiencing problems with expanding their output of goods and services. The Bangladesh Meteorological Department has issued a cautionary signal number three for all maritime ports as Cyclone Dana now has weakened into a cyclonic storm. It's crossed to North Odisha and it's moving west to northwest, potentially affecting Bangladesh's coastal regions. Ports in Chattogram, Cox's Bazaar, Mongla and Pera, they have been advised to raise cautionary signals while fishing boats in the North Bay are urged to remain sheltered until Saturday. Heavy rainfall has already been recorded in Kulna Division with the government implementing precautionary measures along the coast. Let's get you some sports-related news now. New Zealand looks on top in the Pune test. The New Zealand captain Tom Latham uh, helped the visitors' lead go beyond 300 on day two of the second test. For India, Washington Sundar continues his good form with the ball as he picked up four wickets so far, while Ravi Chandran Ashwin has taken one in the second innings of New Zealand, which is the third innings of the match. Uh, Captain Latham scored 86 runs, which uh, put New Zealand in a firm position. Now India have a daunting task ahead of them, as they uh, will be up against a record chase, and they will be batting fourth on this wicket. India have not lost a test series after 2012, after this is at home, and uh, they have never lost a test series at home to New Zealand. Washington Sundar fought a lone battle for India as New Zealand extended their lead to 301 at stumps on day two. The match between India and New Zealand ended in a draw in the final round-robin match of uh, both teams at the Sultan of Johar Cup 2024. We're talking about hockey now. After 60 minutes of intense hockey, both teams ended up with three goals each. With this, New Zealand have become the only team to go unbeaten in this league stage. Gujjoth opened the scoring for India in the first quarter, while New Zealand's Jonti Elms equalised in the second. Rohit scored another goal to give India the lead. However, New Zealand bounced back strongly, with Elms scoring twice to complete his hat-trick. India was awarded a penalty corner in the dying minutes of the game, which was converted brilliantly, uh, ending the match in a tie. The Indian Grandmaster Arjun Erigaisi has made history on Thursday by becoming the youngest Indian to surpass the coveted 2800 yellow rating mark. Erigaisi is also only the second Indian in the country after Vishwanath and Anand to surpass that mark. Arjun is uh, playing for Team Alkaloid in the European Chess Cup uh, in 2024, where he has defeated the Russian Dmitry Andreklin in the fifth round with white pieces to achieve this feat. He was very close to it even last month, but uh, and now he has done so. This win also helped him to become world number three in the live rating list. Arjun became the 16th player to cross the 2800 mark in history. The 21-year-old also showed a strong performance in the French Team Chess Championship, which propelled him to the top five of the FIDE rankings, making him the highest-ranked Indian currently in the world rankings. Fener Bhaksh's court, uh, Jose Mar Marino, was sent off uh, as his side uh, drew 1-1 with his former club Manchester United in the European League on Thursday night. United had led at a break, though Christian Eriksen's fourth goal of the season. But uh, the horse leveled four minutes after the restart when Yusuf N. Nesiri got between United defenders to head home Alan St. Maxim's cross from close range. The visitors also failed to avoid another injury issue as Brazilian wide man Anthony was stretched off when he landed awkwardly after attempting an unnecessary flick by the touchline. United have three points after drawing their opening three games in the competition, while unbeaten Fenerbahce, they have five points. Absolutely fantastic against the team, in theory, from a superior level. We played fantastic. 
maybe you are not happy that we played so well. Maybe the Turkish press is not happy that we played so well. But I'm very happy that we played so well. And to finish a game against Manchester United with the feeling that we lost two points means that we, we played very well. The much-anticipated Pravasi Pariche 2024 that opened earlier this week transformed the Indian Embassy in Riyadh into an artistic haven through the Pravasi Pariche art exhibition. In a vibrant celebration of Indian cultural diversity, 13 Indian women artists brought India's rich heritage to life in Riyadh in this exhibition. Inaugurated by the Indian Ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Dr. Suhail Ajaz Khan, the week-long exhibition is not only serving as a bridge between the two cultures, but also strengthening the cultural bonds between India and Saudi Arabia through creative expression. Well, that's all we have in this edition of DD India News Hour. Let's know your thoughts on the news of the day. For those of you on the go, you can get the latest news and updates from India and across the world on the DD India mobile app. The app is available on Android and iOS platforms. Scan the QR code and download it now. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Mark Lynn from all of us here in Delhi. Thank you very much for watching DD India News Hour. Namaskar. <laughs>